All right. Trevor is talking about trivial meet and join within the lattice of monotone triangles. How exciting. All right, let's hear it. Yeah, so I'll be talking about this paper by uh, our own Adam Hammett and John Angers titled Trivial Meet and Join Within the Lattice of Monotone Triangles. You just hit the right arrow. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, so we're going to define a monotone triangle. Um, if we have n, a positive integer, a monotone triangle tau of size n is a triangular arrangement of elements of the first n positive integers, such that if we let tau of i comma j denote the jth entry in row i, those two conditions hold for one is less than equal to j is less than i. So the first condition tells us um, essentially that when we have, oh here, I have, I have examples that'll help me explain it. It's kind of, a couple examples of monotone triangles there. The first condition tells us that within a row, um, if we have an entry, the entry to the right of it is always greater than it, it's strictly greater. And the second condition will tell us that uh, if we go like diagonally up into the right, then it's weakly increasing. So that means it's always greater than or equal to, and same with going diagonally down into the right. So that's what the second condition tells us. And then there's a couple other things to note is that uh, for one, the bottom row, since it has to contain n elements, and since it's it has to be strictly increasing, it has to contain all of the elements in order. So the bottom, the bottom row is always just one, two, three, and so on up to n. Um, You can hit the arrow button on your keyboard. That's Thanks. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's um there's a bijection between the set of monotone triangles of size n and the set of n by n alternating sign matrices. An alternating sign matrices is a it's a a matrix. It's a square matrix with entries that are only negative one, zero, or one, such that when you look at just a row or a column, the sum of all the entries in that row or column is always one, and the non-zero entries always alternate in sign. So if we have some monotone triangle on the left there, we can get to uh, an alternating sign matrix there on the right through, there's kind of like an intermediate matrix there to see, see the connection between them. And it goes both ways. So for every, for each monotone triangle, there's uh, an alternating sign matrix, and for each alternating sign matrix, there's a monotone triangle. And so, to get from the monotone triangle to the alternating sign matrix, we take, uh, we go row by row. So for the first row in the monotone triangle, we just have the element three. So then in the intermediate matrix, we'll put a one in the third entry there. And then the second row in the monotone triangle is two and four. So we'll put a one in the second entry and a one in the fourth entry and so on. So that the third row will have the first, third, and fourth. And the bottom row will have all four. And then to get from that intermediate matrix to the alternating sign matrix, we, um, we go down, uh, we go in the intermediate matrix down like the first column and how do I describe this? I didn't think about this. Uh, um, just you go, okay, uh, those ones that are in that intermediate matrix are gotten at by adding all the entries so far as you go down the column. Yeah. So it's like the sum. The so total like sum. the total sum. Yeah. So so right. So if you go down. The first column, what's the total sum so far? Zero. So what must have been the upper left entry? Zero. Zero. Uh, you go down and then you go to the set down to the second entry. What's the sum so far? 
zero. So what must have been that so second must have been zero. zero? Leave it under the third one. So what must have been that third entry? One. And then yeah. you go back, and then and then it says one again over here on the left. So the, so for the total sum to be one, it must have just added zero. Yeah, that's right. And then the like, second the second column is more interesting. We can talk through that one. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so for the second column. Um, and then you in the intermediate matrix, it starts with a zero. So then the alternating sign matrix will also start with a zero. And it changes to a one. And to, so then the total sum is one. To get from zero to one, we have to add one. But then the third, the third row, the second column, is a zero again. And so to change the total sum from one to zero, we have to subtract one. So then we put a minus one in the alternating sign matrix. And to go back to one again, we add one again. And so that's that's how they're uh, connected there. And there's also a connection between monotone triangles and permutations. So every permutation has an associated monotone triangle. So a permutation uh, can be thought of as an ordering of the elements of the first n positive integers. So for example, those are the six permutations of length three. The way we construct a monotone triangle from a permutation is that the first row will just contain the first number in the permutation. And the second row will contain the first two in the permutation and so on. So, and they'll be, they'll be in, they have to be in ascending order. So like, for example, like these are the six um, monotone triangles of size three um, with each triangle having the bottom row one, two, three, because um, all, of, all of them will have the same bottom row by necessity. So for example, with the first one, it's the permutation one, two, three. In the monotone triangle, the first row contains one, the second row contains one and two, and the third row will contain one, two, and three. And then for the second one, uh, the permutation starts, well, the permutation is one, three, two. So then the first row will just have one, and the second row will have one and three, and so on. And going back to the alternating sign matrices, since there's a bijection between the set of monotone triangles of size n and the set of all n by n alternating sign matrices, uh, there's the same number of them. So there's the same number of alternating sign matrices of size n as there are uh, monotone triangles of size n. And there's, there's this. Uh, handy conjecture that gives us what that number is um, that Dr. Hammond and uh, John Angers quoted in their paper. And it's this product. So that's how many there are of size n. That was a conjecture at one point, and it was proved in, in 1997 by Cooperberg. By and Cooperberg. Using statistical physics, and then by Joran Zalberger using more standard combinatorial techniques. So that the formula that it was it was conjectured for a long time, but that obnoxious thing was the formula counting the number of alternating sign matrices. But uh, nobody knew how to prove it. And then suddenly two people could prove it in 1997. So yeah. Clearly that's gotta be way bigger than any factorial, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it contains the permutations. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So, like in their paper, Angers and Hammett used that they used the number of monotone triangles of size n is greater than or equal to n factorial. And that's true because if you have a permutation of length n, there is a monotone triangle associated with it. And then we can talk about. Uh, whether a monotone triangle is greater than or less than another monotone triangle. 
And this just boils down to comparing them entry by entry. So if each entry in one monotone triangle is less than or equal to each of the uh, respective entries in another monotone triangle, then we say that the first monotone triangle is less than or equal to the second. And we say that one monotone triangle is equal to another if and only if all of their entries are the same. So for example, we could compare triangle one and triangle two. Or no, we can't compare them, sorry. You can try to. You can try to, <laughs> yeah. So if we were to try to compare these, we might look at the entry in the first row and see that the entry in the second tri triangle is less than the entry in the first triangle. But then also, if we go to the second row, the first entry in the second row of the first triangle is less than the corresponding entry in the second triangle. So we can't say that one is less than the other, and they're certainly not equal. So there's no way to say that one is less than the other. Let's compare them, which is just what I wrote there. Um, and okay, so, so the idea of an infimum and a supremum, um, an infimum given like a set of objects is like the biggest object that's less than or equal to all of the objects in the set. And the corresponding idea of a supremum is that it's the smallest object that is greater than or equal to all of the objects in the set. And so the way that we define then femum and supremum of a set of monotone triangles here is entry by entry, just like the greater than, less than. Oh. And so the then femum and supremum will both be themselves another monotone triangle. And we, yeah, so like going, going entry by entry, we just take the minimum of uh, that entry for each monotone triangle. And then we take that entry to be the one in the infimum. We build, we build the infimum and supremum monotone triangles out of that. So just kind of a couple examples to clear up, clear up what I'm saying. Um, so if we have these two monotone triangles, tau one and tau two, uh, their infimum is that triangle and their supremum is that triangle. So to get their infimum, we see that in the entry in the first row, the minimum is two. So the infimum will have the entry two in the first row. And in the second row, the first entry uh, in the first triangle is a one and the second triangle is a two and their minimum is a one. So that'll be the entry in the infimum. And then similar, similarly for the supremum, we'll just take those maximum values from those two entries. And then so kind of thinking about the permutations again, um, we can order, so these, these are monotone triangles of size three without the bottom row. The bottom row is truncated. They're all just one, two, three. They're all the same. Um, what we have here is that the, the maximal permutation here is three, two, three, one, two, three. And you know, like the all of the other uh, triangles are less than it. And so like if if there's a line connecting two monotone triangles, that's just saying that the one lower is less than the one higher than it. Um, but one thing that uh, one problem we can run into here is if we try to talk about the infimum of two, two, three, one, two, three, and three, one, three, one, two, three. Because the triangles one, one, three, and two, one, two are both, they both are less than um, those two triangles, but they themselves are not comparable. So there's not a well-defined infimum for those two. And similarly for the supremum of one, one, three, and two, one, two. But then 
if we if we go back to the definition of nymphemum within the monotone triangles, uh, there is there is a well-defined nymphemum, and it's two one three, but that can't be associated with any permutation because of the way that we obtain um, monotone triangles from permutations. Um, the way the way we did it was by adding one new number to each row. It's like the first. The first row contains the first number in the permutation, the second row contains the second two in the permutation, and so on. But the triangle 213 has two new, has two new numbers in the second row, which means that it can't come from a permutation. So one, one advantage that the set of monotone triangles has over the set of permutations is that there's always well-defined infimums and supremums. So within the monotone triangles, uh, the minimal monotone triangle of size n is given by uh, its entry at the coordinate ij being j. Um, so that just means that the first row will be one, second row will be one, two, and so on down to one through n. And of course, those are the, in each entry, those are the smallest numbers that you can have because you'd have to start with the one on the left. And then it always has to be strictly increasing as you move to the right. And the, the maximal element is defined similarly. So you just start on the right of the triangle with an n, since that's the biggest element you can have. And you just subtract one each time as you move left. So the first row will be n, second row will be n minus one, and then n, and so on. So that's so every monotone triangle is less than or equal to the maximal element and greater than or equal to the minimal element. So in the paper that Engers and Hammett wrote, they focus on two main questions. How likely is it that our independent and uniformly random monotone triangles will have a trivial meet? And how likely are they to have a trivial join? And meet is just another word for infimum. And join is just another word for supremum. A way to say it and sound like you really are smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so those those are the two probabilities that they want to find. But then it turns out that these are in fact the same probability, which they go to show in their paper. And the way that they do this is by um, constructing a different, well, it's some mapping. So they map, hmm. trying to think how this went. <clears throat> so give, given an arbitrary monotone triangle, yeah, all you can do is you go across the rows, you reverse the rows. Yeah. So you go across every single row in tau, you flip the rows around. Now the numbers are completely backwards. And to fix that, you just go n plus one minus that entry and you replace it. That's what we're doing. Yeah, this one made more sense, like the <laughs> graphically drawing it out. Yeah, yeah. The triangles in like well, this. like writing it analytically yeah. is a, a little bit confusing, but all we do is you just go across the rows, flip them like this. So you'll have like five, three, one, but then you just take n plus one minus that so that you get something that's, that's yeah. actually an increase in order instead. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and so what you're doing that both those, the, uh, lattice structure that you drew with all the arcs and everything, you put all the elements in there. All we're doing is we're instead of being like in one part of the picture, we're going up to another part of the picture that looks exactly the same, but it's kind of flipped over. That's it. So, yeah. so what they what they basically do is they show that there's a symmetry there, where, um, where like you said. Thinking about the probability of infimum being the smallest element 
is the same. It's there's a symmetry between that masking whether the supremum is the maximal uh, is the maximal element. So that's kind of what I went through here, which is kind of maybe hard to hard for me to explain, hard to read through, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of skim over that. Um, and so what they did in their paper, what they showed in their paper is that by well, what they did is they found a lower bound and an upper bound for this probability. And they showed that it's about the number of monotone triangles in your set divided by the total number of monotone triangles of size n. And that's um, that's about the same as the probability of just one of those triangles in your set being the minimal element. Um, and they also went on at the end of their paper to find a second order term. And so if you look at this, this big expression, the, um, the first order term is just kind of on the left of the numerator there. When you divide that by a n to the r, you get the expression up there in their main result. And then the second term is more complicated there, but it has an eight a n to the r minus two term on it. Uh, and when you, it's like, um, and compared compared to the other term with the a n to the r minus one, um, it's it's like dividing by a to the n, or sorry, a of n, which is kind of like dividing by n factorial since a n is greater than or equal to n factorial. So the second term is like a lot smaller than the first term. And then there's like, a, and then the, the O there and all the other stuff is just saying that everything else is like really small, right? Pretty much. That means that everything else is like theta of that means that everything else is basically a constant times that thing that's in there. Some kind of constant and phi or whatever it is. So, Yep, that's about all I had to share. What, okay, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What does that little twiddle notation mean? What does that mean? Like you say P min twiddle R over A of N. What does that mean? Does that mean that it's um, like a constant multiple or it it's like it it's it's pretty similar? I don't oh. know what exactly it means. What it means is that it means that the limit as n goes to infinity of p min over this expression uh, equals one. So the ratio of whatever p min happens to be in that fraction is really, really, really that fraction is really close to one if, if n is large. Yeah. So this this notation right here is basically saying that this is like as n goes to infinity, right? So as the number of or as the size of the monotone triangle gets huge. And you mentioned something about. Um, that probability is like the probability of one of the mono because remember this was for all randomly selected monotone triangles. Yes. Yes. If, if if one of them was the minimum monotone triangle, then the infimum would be the minimum. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that's basically how we got the lower bound. We we're like, well, what's the probability that one of them is the you know the minimal element? Well, it's basically like R over A of N. And then we're and then we spent the rest of our time showing. Uh really that's that's a pretty good approximation to the actual probability. It's kind of interesting. Uh, any questions for Trevor? Yeah. The author's talk was all about like what on earth inspired them to do this. I don't know, it seems kind of random <laughs> to think about probabilities relating to 
monotone triangles. I don't know. Did they talk about where this problem came from and how they went about? A lot of the introduction of the paper talked um, with like the connections to alternating sign matrices and permutations and things like that, and kind of placing their work within the wider realm of the mathematical world. Um, I don't know if there was a particular motivation besides to answer the question. But <clears throat> it's a pretty common course. question. I mean, for my, so for instance, Trevor showed that if you just take the permutations, you don't get a lattice structure. There aren't well-defined infimums, yes? So if you just add a few more elements, you do get a lattice structure, but it's not just a few more elements, it's a lot. Uh, because you get all the alternating sign matrices, or I mean, monotone triangles just blow the number of permutations away. So to fix the problem, you add a lot of you add a lot of elements and you add a lot of structure. This question right here, you're saying, okay, if I'm computing in femums, how often does it happen that if I take a couple of monotone triangles, I actually don't end up super far away from the from the two monotone triangles? If two monotone triangles are comparable to each other, that is one below the other, then the ephemum is going to be the smaller of the two. Don't you see? Yeah. So what we're basically asking is how often does it happen that these things are so kind of obnoxiously far apart from one another that I have to go all the way down to the minimal element to actually find something that's well below both of them. It's saying something about the structure of this is a partially ordered set. Like not everything is comparable. It's not a total order like real numbers. It is a partial ordering. So you're trying to ask the question of how obnoxiously uh, incomparable are two elements? If they're really obnoxiously incomparable, then you would expect the infimum to just be the trivial element at the bottom. And what we showed is the probability of that happening is quite small actually. So it seems like these overall, there's a feeling that things are tending to be comparable, or at least close to being comparable. My entire dissertation didn't focus on this partially ordered set, but it focused on the one that just had the permutations on it. And just comparing the permutations and literally what, what, what I did was ask the question, what's the probability that a couple of these things are comparable to each other? Like if you give me a couple of them, are they even going to be comparable? Is one going to be below the other or not? And then what Ford and I looked at was a different version of this where you take out, or actually no, you still look at the permutations, but you're so a different order. Yeah, you instead of it's kind of hard to explain. You uh, it turns out that the one with the permutations that Trevor drew, like it had those things going across like this. Yeah. The one Ford and I looked at got rid of not right that one. So the problem is that X going across right there. If I if I could get rid of those arcs in the middle, I, I everything would I mean you you would you would have an infimum for every pair of things at that point. So what what Ford McElroy and I did was do, was do work on that problem, like the partially ordered set where we just remove arcs and don't we keep just the permutations and we remove certain arcs and we look at something called the weak order on those. And we asked the exact same question that, that John and I did in this paper. So we were able to figure it out. That one actually was more complicated than, than this one that Trevor looked at. We had to do like complex analysis and a whole bunch of other things. So yeah. But we haven't written that up yet. So other questions for Trevor? Cool, thank you, sir. Appreciate thank you. you. Yeah. All right, Blair, uh, all you have to do is hit escape and then you pull yours up and. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, 
So I did my presentation on Dr. Fry and Dr. Sellers paper on powers of two dividing the values of certain plane partition functions. So to start, I'm going to define for you guys um, what a plane partition actually is. So a plane partition <laughs> is a two dimensional array of integers that's not increasing from left to right and top to bottom. So here's an example for n equal to 24. As you can see, the numbers are not increasing from top to bottom. And they're generally like visually represented as unit blocks kind of cascading out of the corner of a box, um, which that was a lot more helpful for me in understanding them. Just kind of pushed over in a corner. Yeah. Yeah. So there's several different like families of plane partitions, but <laughs> the two that we're gonna deal with today are the totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions. And totally symmetric just means that, so of the like six ways you can orient this box, the plane partition will look the same in all of those permutations. And then self-complementary means that the negative space um, in, you can kind of faintly see it in the box is the same as the positive space. So the negative space is the plane partition itself. And then for the cyclically symmetric transpose complement plane partition, it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, you only have symmetry for like three of those permutations. So basically, I think it's that you can turn that like you could turn the box like this, but you couldn't like turn it forward or backward. Um, and then transpose complement means that if you took the negative space out of that box, it's the mirror image of the plane partition itself. So can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. I, I should know this, but so I this, forgot. Uh, why, so totally symmetric, you can rotate the box and so one, two, three, ways, mm -hmm. one of them being this way, and you get the same plane partition. Yes. What, what are the other three things? I think that Dr. Fry was trying to explain this to me, and it's kind of, it's really hard to picture. Is it the negative think, space? Yes. So I think like oh, I if you it. flip yeah, yeah, the yeah. box like this. I see the negative space. Like if you, if you look at it, you see the L shapes on the top and on the side, there's like an, uh, there's a carved out L shape right there on the upper left, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then this one, so there's actually right like here. Dr. Fry nor I could find any pictures of cyclically symmetric transpose complement. So this is cyclically symmetric, but this is not transpose complement. Okay, okay. okay. Um, okay. But yeah, those turnings of the box are kind of hard to wrap your head around. So both these families of plane partition functions, um, or no, both these families of plane partitions have functions that represent the number of totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions and the cyclically symmetric transpose complement plane partitions that fit within a 2n by 2n by 2n box. So as you might have noticed, that first function looks strangely familiar to what Trevor just presented on. Um, and so in their paper, they proved that the highest power of two that divides T sub n and the highest power of two that divides C sub n is actually the same. So their proof relies heavily on this lemma, which says that for any prime P and positive integer n, the highest order of p that divides n, yeah, that divides n factorial is given by the sum of this like greatest integer or step function, which is what allowed them to write c sub n as the following sum. So if you look at this, it's basically like using those functions with the factorials and then the lemma got that first line for C sub n. And then the rest of the proof is purely like manipulation of the sums. So basically, because 
it's a step function, they're able to combine those last two mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. And then here they divided three by two, so they got two to the k minus one, which then combined with this actually is telescoping. So they were able to write that here. And then from there, they divided both of these by two and got the two to the k minus one and then wrote out the first term. And then they um, so moved that into this, which this just turned out to be zero. And then they unsimplified what they simplified in terms of the step functions. So this becomes both of these. And then the rest of it is just adjusting the bounds. So basically on the previous slide, you can kind of, the way Dr. Fry explained this to me is you can kind of think of these as like getting evens and odds. And so then when you adjust the sums, you can combine them into one. And then those last two terms in the top line, you can combine again. And then you get this, which by the lemma gives you or two of T sub n. So from this main result, the authors proved several other theorems, which this is the part of the paper. It's interesting because um, that main proof they do in the first like three pages of the paper. So then the rest of it is proving these implications, which they proved using some previous research that they had done specifically like with the Jacobs cell numbers and alternating sign matrices. So we're going to take a little detour to go through that. So the function T sub n also represents the number of n by n alternating sign matrices, which Trevor was talking about earlier. And so T sub n and A sub n are the same. And again, the alternating sign matrices are square matrices, one zeros and negative ones, where each row and column adds up to one, and the signs of the ones have to alternate. By the way, if you want to become a famous combinatorialist by tomorrow, uh, you could, the number of total, totally symmetric self complementary plane partitions that fit into a two n by two n by two n box mm -hmm. is the same as the number of alternating sign matrices. Yeah. Which means there ought to be a direct bijection between those two combinatorial objects. True. The way that we did, I mean, Trevor gave a direct bijection, like you literally mm -hmm. construct an alternating sign matrix from a monotone triangle, yes? But there's not one that exists for this. There's not, there's no, well, no, there's, the bijection. Not known, there's not a known one. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the grand um, gold medals of all combinatorics. Hmm. There's the, there's that one, finding a direct bijection between totally symmetric self complementary plane partitions that fit into a two in by two in by two in box. And there's also uh, uh, another, another thing that, that is counted by the same formula that mm -hmm. I won't get into right now. And, and nobody knows what the bijection is between those. Mm -hmm. so, right. so just an example of this connection, if you have n equals three, T sub n, so the number of totally symmetric self complementary plane partitions, and the number of alternating sign matrices, there are seven of each. So these are the seven alternating sign matrices. And um, you can see how the signs of the ones have to alternate. So the previous paper was um, Jacob Stahl numbers and alternating sign matrices written just the year before in which the authors proved that A sub n, so here's some of the, the iterations, you can see just how quickly it grows. Um, so that number is odd if and only if n is a Jacobstall number. Um, so these numbers, the Jacobstall numbers are given by that recurrence, which basically you start with one and three, and then you take this number plus twice the previous number. So then you get five and then it's 11 
and 21. Dot, dot, dot. So they also gave an explicit definition given by that. Go um, back to that previous slide. Yeah. So the first one should be on. It is. It's one. Yes. The third one should be on. Mm -hmm. But then and the next the odd one. is like 11. What about five? Or no, five. Five is. Four, seven, 429, is that what that says? Yes. So the only ones that are odd are the ones that are indexed by the Jacob song. Yes. So this brings us back to the implications in the paper that I went over. Um, so this just says that T sub n is congruent to C sub n mod two, which is obvious by the main result of the paper if you have the highest order of two that divides them is equivalent. Um, and then the second one, they proved that they're equivalent mod four. And the key to understanding this is that that result is automatically true for ord two of T sub n greater than or equal to one, because if ord two of T sub n is two, then both numbers would be a multiple of four, so they'd both be zero mod four. Um, so then the only ends that we have to check are those for when, well, similarly, if ord two of T sub n is one, then they're both two mod four. Um, but if ord T sub n is zero, those are the ones we have to check, which those are when T sub n is odd, which we know is only at the Jacob Stahl numbers. So using that explicit definition of the Jacob Stahl numbers, um, they were able to show that for all n greater than or equal to one, both T sub n and C sub n of the nth Jacob Stahl number are equivalent to negative one to the n minus one mod four. And that they didn't, um, they didn't enumerate all the steps of that proof in this paper. Um, in fact, they cited the work of some other people um, in terms of those like calculations. Is this the one that was in ours combinatoria? I'm not for sure. What I looked at the paper, but I didn't pay attention to what it was published in. Okay. Um, so the second two implications involve the following corollary that if the highest order of two that divides C sub n is some number k, such that k is greater than or equal to one, then n is less than the 2k plus one Jacob Stahl number. So using that, they were able to prove that t, t of n is congruent to C of n uh, mod 16 for all n greater than or equal to one, so long as n is not a Jacob Stahl number. So similarly to the other two implications, they had like a certain number of n's that they were going to have to check. So they had to check between two and one because obviously if they're, if ord two of t sub n is four, then they're both zero mod 16. If it's three, then they'd both be um, multiples of eight and not 16. So they're both eight mod 16. Um, but then using the aforementioned corollary to check those, they were able to say that okay, we have to check the ends between one and the fifth Jacob Stahl number subtracted by one. And then, so that comes out to one and 20 because the fifth Jacob Stahl number is 21. So then they just took all those ends and plugged them into um, T sub n and C sub n and found that they were in fact all congruent mod 16. And then the last one is kind of like a generalization of the previous implications. So it says that for all positive integers k and all but finitely many n greater than or equal to one and not a Jacob Stahl number, uh, t sub n, or not t sub n, t of n and c of n are um, congruent to each other mod two to the k. So obviously this, one is a little bit more limited because they restricted it to 
they said all but finitely many n. Um, so they knew that you'd have to check the um, or two of t sub n between one and k minus two. Um, but because of the corollary, which we used for the previous implication, that implies that the only non Jacobs Stahl positive integers n for which or two of t of n is less than k minus two satisfies that. So this was the hardest for me to understand because it's. Well, the problem with general k is you can't. You can't check everything. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they could do it for k equal to. You know, mm -hmm. Some number. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is what was on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. K was four. Is that right? Yeah. So we had k was four, uh -huh. and then the previous one was yeah. k is two. So maybe you could just, you know, you could bang it on the head with maple or something. But here you would have to come up with some other argument for why those finitely many n still satisfy uh, the difficulty of x. Yeah. So that is all I have for you guys today. But I used both of these papers. And like I was talking with Dr. Hammond about before class, there's actually a third paper they wrote where they deal with, OK, do these implications, this result, deal with primes other than two? So. The answer is yes. Spoiler alert. So hang on, can you oh. go back? So yeah. Sure. Oh, so these were in the journal of integer sequences. Okay. Yes. I think the third one is was published in Ars Combinatoria or something. But and actually, these papers are the reason that I came to Cedarville in the first place. The sequence of three papers. Uh, I mean, I didn't read them until like 2014 or 13 or something. But uh, I looked through them and I thought, what's going on in Cedarville? Because uh, I was interested in alternate design matrices, obviously, because Trevor showed them. And ironically, Dr. Ryan and I have never written a paper on combinatorics together, but we have written on divisibility tests. Uh, but maybe that will happen someday. Yeah. So, questions for Claire? So, in the third paper, it's the powers of any prime dividing certain. Partition function, right? It's very mm -hmm. to extract the power of any prime. Yes. Which means you could actually get a prime factorization of the alternating sign matrix numbers, which is hmm. quite quite interesting. If you know the number, yeah, I didn't twos, think about that. The number of threes, number of fives, etc. Then you can say, oh, I know how to factorize this thing. Hmm. So. I have a question. Yeah. So um, I guess the box has to be like 2n by 2n by 2n, right? Mm -hmm. What would it be like? I guess it doesn't work for odd, or like boxes with odd side length. Let me think about that. You're saying if it was like a 3n by 3n by 3n yeah. box? Yeah, for example. So in odd. Hmm. Are you saying you don't think the functions would work, or you're? No, I, I was just kind of asking like why it has to be like uh, even. I'm not sure. Okay. I can't think of a reason it would have to be, because. I mean, with the one where like the negative and positive squares are symmetric, I mean, like that one has to be for it to. Uh, for the negative and positive squares to work out. I don't know about the other one. Hmm. 
I don't have to think about that. The issue is uh, Sellers. He's he's at the University of Minnesota now. He's at Penn State University for a long time, but he was at Cedarville when this paper was written. Um, he would he is an expert in claim partitions. So uh, I mean, there's just tons of stuff that people do with claim partitions and that dates all the way back to someone named Ramanujan. You ever heard that name before? Indian mathematician. Um, he was one of the first that kind of looked at this alongside G. H. Hardy, pretty famous number theorists. But um, I don't know. I, I I mean, first of all, you don't to get the alternating sign matrix numbers. Obviously, you would have to have two n by two n by two n because you just get them in sequence if you do it that way. But I don't know why you couldn't th think of the concept of a totally symmetric self complementary plane partition in a bigger box in like a, another weird box. You could still talk about that. Yeah. And certainly it would grow like if you did three n by three n by three n, it would be bigger than the number that fit inside a two n by two n by two n box, right? Because all the two n by two n by two n would fit inside of a three n by three n by three n. Yes, right. Or do you, do you have to have the negative space thing working out? I think you do for these families because otherwise it wouldn't be. Well, I guess it would still be self complementary if the box is bigger. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to learn with, with these things. But again, if you go over to Chuck's tonight and figure out a bijection between TSSCPPs and, uh, and alternating sign matrices, um, you'd be pretty famous by, uh, by the weekend. So, yeah. After that. Um, so, you said that they pretty much proved like the main part of their, because they kind of solved it really early on, right? Yeah. So was that, like, did they know they were going to do that and wanted to focus more on the implications? Or did just, like, how did that work out? Um, I asked him about this because he walked me through this. And then I was like, OK, we're on page three of the paper. I was like, what am I going to talk about for the rest of the paper? And um, he. Yeah, so I think like because of the lemma, they were able to do this like really just by manipulating the sums. And so having written the previous paper, I think they that is kind of what sparked them to do a lot of the implications because they now had this. So then they just kind of combined that with the parts of their previous paper that were relevant in order to come up with some implications. Yeah, because I knew precisely which of those numbers were odd. Mm -hmm. they, they happen to be the ones that are indexed by the Jacobson numbers. Yeah. And they're talking about powers of two. And uh, if there aren't any powers of two, those are odd. And hence, they knew that those happened right at the Jacobson number values again. Other questions? But yes, to answer your question, I think this paper was partly motivated by wanting to build off of their previous results. What else? Well, cool. Thank you. Thank you all. That was enjoyable. Um, by the way, all, uh, so I have these rubrics, I'm kind of slowly filling out, but I'll, once everybody's presented their presentations, I'll kind of upload your uh, sheet it's for you to see. So thank you all. I'll upload the video and I'll also um, upload the actual slides themselves for people to look at that. Next week, we'll have the last one.